know, because I know they can shoot as prison escapees. They don't have to. Get... <laughs> and I'll tell you how I avoided getting shot when I did mine. Yeah. I thought they were going to kill me because <laughs> so, I was a law clerk. Unfortunately, I knew the law about that. They don't have to. Uh, once you escape from prison, it's game on. So. No, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm surprised this guy survived, to be honest with you. All right. Let me timestamp the beginning of the show. I'll introduce it as breaking news on Prison Escape E Recaptured, and then we'll go into okay. the side notes, maybe 20-minute, 30-minute show max. I'll try to get it out tonight. Okay. All right? So let me see. 51, 35. Welcome to William Steele, Steel Spotlight, True Crime with my guest host, Ignacio Esteban, we got breaking news. Yeah, it's an incredible right. story. We're touching base on prison escapees because we just had a big one who got captured. So, yes. Ignacio, yeah. welcome back to the show. What do we got going on in the news right now? Nice to be back, man. I, I saw that uh, also with all, all these SWAT members for a few weeks out of Pennsylvania. Amazing. Yeah. He went to someone's house, stole a rifle, twenty-two caliber rifle, right? The owners were shooting at him. When he escaped, uh -huh. ran out with that. I mean, this guy was an absolute menace and danger. And after a few weeks being out, they finally captured him. It's amazing. You haven't seen the video? Watch him how he shimmies out, out there. And over he went over the top. That's, that's really, really amazing. To two walls. And he's able to shimmy like this. Uh -huh. And up he went. Uh, and, and he was gone for two and a half weeks. I'm surprised. And, and I know there's a picture of how many SWAT members and other law enforcement were involved in his pursuit. And at the end, they were posing with him. Some controversy over that, but hey, listen, it was hard work. They got the guy. He was a danger. They're He's still in the trophy. rifles. Yeah, he was like a trophy picture. They they posed with him, rightfully so. He's he's a he's a piece of work. But uh, they captured him, and now he's gonna get a lot more time. He was better off. It wasn't worth it. Anytime you escape, Bill, I know you can talk about this. It's not worth escaping because a lot of times they give you another hammer. Boom. <laughs> Unfortunately, now my audience may know this, I escaped from prison. Now, it wasn't anything spectacular, but I had done it several times before and uh, always came back before count time. <laughs> this time I decided to stay gone. <laughs> but we'll get into that in a minute. Bill, let how, would you, how, would you escape? How, how would you escape during the daytime and come back? It was always from the same place. Yeah, it was always it was a lower custody facility. There was three of us, I believe, allowed to work outside the gate and oh, went okay. on state property. On state property. So you had in Florida, you had the prison and you have work camps. Work camps are lower cost custody guys. Not all of them can go outside the, the work camp. They're, they're like housemen. They'll work in the kitchen. Eventually, when you get about a year short of your release, they'll let you work around the perimeter outside cutting grass or at, at the treatment, uh, sewage treatment, water treatment plant that's outside. They had a firehouse in Martin Correctional uh, where the inmate fire, fire, fireman was allowed to work out there overnight until he was think having sex with a 13 year old daughter of the warden or something oh, from no. the trailer park, she would sneak over and they would, you know, whatever. So they eliminated uh -huh. that position. Then they had overnight, uh, when I did it, they had overnight, um, a water treatment plant, a sewage treatment plant. And they also had a thing called expo at Martin correctional institution. Expo was where all the ranchers in, in Florida, I think they may know Florida would bring small cattle there. Now, I was always a law clerk or a library clerk or something like that, you know, or not too much manual labor because, I, you know, they, they work you to death in Florida. So I had a lot of medical passes to get out of doing all that <laughs> stuff. So, unfortunately. But anyway, so they work the guys to death. They still have chain gang down there for disciplinary cases, the cut and mellow the plants and all that. So in my case, I was tired of being indoors and. I wanted to work out in the community. Here's how I did the initial escapes years ago. And then I came back to the same facility years later. Right. The initial right. ones were like this. I was working at a place called Expo, which you have water treatment plant inmate allowed to stay out overnight. You have sewage treatment guy allowed to monitor that and stay out overnight. Then you had one other guy at Expo who had to go through these pens at night and cap count. There was electric fences, count the cattle, like there's Halsteins, there's Brahma bulls, there's this, there's that. And because there was a Florida panther wandering around that prison mm -hmm. area, which was dangerous to the inmates and to the cattle, you know, so I'm not on parole anymore. So I could pretty much speak freely about this. Well, let me ask you, were, you, were, you, were you armed? No, but they, you had a clip. You, you had a clipboard. You had to walk through these lanes in the pitch black, making yeah. sure all they were there, 19 of these, 25 of those, three of these. 
and each pen, because the ranchers would drop their, their animals off there, and about 10 inmates were assigned. And during the day, you would halt to break them and with a show stick and a little whip and get them ready for shows. And you'd brush them, and you'd take care of these baby animals. Th that's a whole other story. But so working out there, a lot of guys, they want to stare at sports. They don't want to work. They don't want to do anything in prison. Me, I wanted to get off the prison grounds as much as possible. Sure. So I would volunteer a lot of times for the daytime shift, nighttime shift, because I'm from Brooklyn. I don't know anything about a cow or a bull. I'm actually afraid of them. I was writing a lot of grievances. I was a law clerk. You know, certain administrators didn't like me. They like called me a handful because I know the policies and I'm always helping inmates enforce their rights. <laughs> yeah, they called me a handful because of the paperwork. You know, I was the guy writing the grievances and filing the lawsuits. But um, so the classification officer, okay, years before, so I'm at, I'm at that job at Expo working with the yeah. animals. And how I escaped several times and during that period of years was – I was working out there overnight. I'm supposed to wander through those lanes and count animals every three or four hours, maybe twice during the night. I forget now. And then, you know, they're all there. The, the, you know, they didn't escape. And they didn't. I just felt like an officer, but I'm counting cows and bulls and then freaking pitch black near the Everglades in Florida in Martin County in Indian Town. So I'm wandering you through the lanes. Did you ever yeah, see a panther? panther? And there's a panther out there. And one of the guys on one of the towers, overnight inmate, he was calling for help because he looked down when he was on top of this tank and the panther was pacing, looking up at him. <laughs> and and they and the, the game and wildlife came and they said, you'll move this prison before we trap and move that panther because it's a protected species. <laughs> so you, they couldn't kill it. They couldn't trap it, according to what we were told at the time. So do you really think right. I was going to yeah. get there at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the evening when it's still light? do one or two counts, and then when it gets dark, I'm not going out there. I stayed locked in the building, well, laid, on, and, laid and, up and, on and a couch. You don't have anything to protect you, and Panthers get hungry. I, I would lay in, inside on a conference table. I got a blanket and a pillow, and I and they had a the officer. It was an officer's training area, really, is what it was. And there was a big screen TV, and I would watch, like, cable TV all night long. And the inmates didn't have any of that. I would never do any of my counts at nighttime. And then I started wandering around. At that time, I was working out. I was using officers' weight machines, and they had all their lockers in there. Well, guess who's a locksmith, right? Uh -huh. So I took, a, I took a rake, you know, the spring rakes you rake leaves with? Back mm -hmm. then, they still had the metal ones. So I took one of those, put it in the, in the, in the vise, took a, uh, a file, and I made some lock picks out of it. So now I started – I got into that building where I wasn't supposed to be, which is next to the one I'm allowed to be in, right, oh, right next to it. I picked the lock to go into the officer's training building. So at night, I'd also be watching all their training videos about how they how they train the officers to go yeah. in on, on inmates, how the cert team works. Um, I broke into a lot of lockers. You, it was all you, you, you know, got a lot of good intel there. That's good, Bill. Oh yeah, I was I was I was leaving the property to do that, which is technically escape or at least you know a very serious unauthorized area, right? But I was also watching the training videos. I was you know they, all the pepper sprays and their canisters were there. There was no weapons there. It wasn't the arsenal, but it was just a training building. Yeah, that's but, dangerous, right? Yeah, but all their gear was there, like there's to, to, to rush into the prisoners and all this stuff. It was it was held out there. So it got so easy that when I worked during the day, especially during sports season, whatever was playing, guys who came to relieve me, which when the, before they got out of the van, they they called me in New York. Hey, New York, can you work my shift, man? I, I had to come out here because the officer has to sign off on it. The officer driving the mm -hmm. other guy out there. As long as the person reported and the officer transporting agreed, I could stay out and work somebody else's shift, but you could only do that for two shifts. There was times I was outside the fence for like three-day period, on Friday oh. through you know, Monday morning, and nobody was catching on. Well, I was messing around with this female officer, and she said, you know, I noticed you've been out here like multiple shifts. Have you gone back to the compound yet? <laughs> And I says, I says, me and you were messing around, and now you're going to tell on me for being off the compound too many days in a row? <laughs> I had a tub. They, they replaced all the rusty tubs out there that the animals drink out of. They would galvanize big tubs mm. with these ones that are the plastic ones, uh, like Rubbermaid or something, big gigantic ones, right? And I took one of those, and I drug it behind the barn. I would fill it with water. Take I'd get out there. I'd hide behind the barn, look through a crack in the barn for the officer coming, and I'd be out there nude sunbathing with a radio <laughs> all afternoon. And then at night, I would hide out away from the panther. And uh, so I was doing this, and then at night, I would break into the yeah. training building. That's interesting time, Bill. There came a point where different 
women I was writing to were involved with would come nearby the prison and there was, there was orange groves nearby. And I yeah. would leave the prison property and go do what we do and go back within an hour or two. And so I did that dozens of times. Martin Correctional, I would say I honestly escaped from, from that place. I don't know. Uh, this is years ago, so statute of limitations is over with <laughs> numerous times. Because every time you walk off the work camp, it's still an escape if you left if you leave state property. Oh, so I, I did it but numerous you, times. But you're, you're coming back and forth, though. I was coming back and forth before count because they drive out there during count. And they, and, and they, they you know, a little where different probably. situation, unlike this guy from Pennsylvania who didn't want to come back. Right. <laughs> so the one time I do it, I'm at the same place years later. And uh, this time I was tired of uh, working in, indoors and it was, I was getting short on my sentence. And I asked the classification lady, I said, Hey, can you sign me back where I was years ago working, you know, outside the gate? And, uh, she said, well, give me a few more months working in, inside. It's, you know, I think it was a house man or something, like mopping the floor of the, of the, the dorm or something. And I says, okay, because there was spots open and the squads that would go into Stewart and they were going, you know, working at the police station or the college or whatever they were doing. These inmates were going out there, you know, enjoying freedom a little bit. So she didn't really want to put me out there. And then next thing you know, my, my job got changed, my custody got dropped, and I started going out there. And in my case, my escape, we were working in Stewart by a bridge. I forget the name of the bridge now, going over the, the, the river or whatever. Sure. And there, there was a washout there. And so they had these DOT trucks with dirt, and they were dropping piles of dirt down there. And we had to go shovel it back under the bridge and tamp it in and mm -hmm. all this nonsense. Good workout. Yep. So the day I went, you know, without teaching everybody how, how to do this, they had a, quite a few escapes from work camps, from work details out in the community. And so they were – having to call in their work squad like once an hour like they had eyes on 10 inmates or whatever the squad was they stepped it up to doing checks every 15 minutes they had to lay eyes on you and then they would call you know, like dot3 who's the squad i was on or public work squad or whatever clear you know i have all my inmates here 10 people are here and i noticed my supervisor wasn't really doing them he was calling them in but he was, wasn't laying eyes on everybody he was they were annoyed with having to do it so frequently so I, I used that opportunity. It took off, and and immediately I, I, I left. I, I stripped off my clothes. I had some shorts on. I went up the other side of the bridge. He's leaning over, looking down at the work detail. I'm on the other side of him in traffic at the bridge, and I started hitting, like, you know, backyards. Tried to stop somebody for a ride. They wouldn't stop. Then there was a meter reader who parked his bike, and beautiful homes around that area, really nice area. And he was walking between homes, meter reader, whatever, I saw him go, and I jumped on his bike. I escaped oh, from a minute before, you know, on the side of the road. So I took off on his bike, and he, he sees it, and he's screaming, Hey, that's my bike! And he starts trying to chase me. Here's what happened, Ignacio. He called that in immediately to Stewart PD or 911 or whatever he did, right? And you know what they told him? We're not sending anybody out for a stolen bike. Come down to the police station and fill out a police report, Right. Never realizing it's somebody who just escaped from prison, right? Yeah, they, they know. He, they didn't know at the time. My supervisor had been logging in his checks for another three or four checks, like an hour worth of checks, before he, he was looking for me, wondering where I was. And everybody was like, we don't know where he is. <laughs> you know, we don't know where he We haven't seen him. We thought you'd let him take a break. Yeah. So he had been calling in falsified checks. Oh, boy. Yeah, he didn't lay eyes on me. And the proof is... The first call to 911 is here. Let's say it was 9 a.m. And his call in the work camp saying, I got somebody missing. He missed four counts already where he claimed I was there. The proof is I was gone for an hour. So I think he got in some trouble or suspended for a I while. Imagine. For yeah, yeah, imagine that happened. For falsifying. How, 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 do they catch, how do they catch you, Bill? He, he was a very nice guy, and I feel bad if he got in trouble. But that's what happened. It was able to prove a big gap, but he was not He was falsifying his logs. Gotcha. Um, so, so you're on the bike. What happens? I go to the bike. I, I took some tools and phone numbers uh, out with me, or some tools from the truck. I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna columnize a car. <laughs> I was gonna steal a car. You know the old tilt wheel uh, GMs. You could break this thing, whatever. I'm not gonna get into how you do it, and they're pretty easy to start. So I was gonna look for like a relatively older, easier car to take, and take off. Um, I took that to a uh, condominium complex about a half mile away, and I know you have to break the centrail. 
because you know Florida's a police state. They're gonna put up the helicopters and seal the perimeter and bring the dogs and you oh, know the U.S. Marshals and the county sheriff and the police and the DOC guys yeah, and everybody they, on you, huh? Right. They responded in force, and I got to this place, couldn't find a car I was looking to get. I hid the bike under a staircase, and I saw these two women that were just talking, the, the older women, in front of the door of one of the units, and I made up a story on the fly. I said, "Hey." Do you know if there's another entrance to this place? Because I, we just bought the condo down there. I locked my keys in my car, and I just got a call that my wife's going into premature labor with our twins while she was at the, uh, you know, the other doctor, a, a podiatrist or something, and they they took her to the hospital. That's a friend of mine calling from prison in California. I'm sorry, I can't take the call, Dave. But anyway, he's uh, he's actually innocent, and we're trying to help him get out. His family stole millions of dollars from this guy. But anyway. That's Dave Reinhardt. So I, I, I said, because I called the taxi and I've been waiting and waiting and the taxi hasn't showed up. And they said, well, we mm -hmm. didn't see a taxi come in. Um, and one of them said, but I can give you a ride. You know what hospital they took her to? And I said, well, I appreciate the ride, but I'm not sure. Can we go to, and I knew there was a doctor's office about two miles out when we went to work in the morning. I saw it. So I just gave her the name of that place. I said, she was over there last I know. Just drop me off there. They'll tell me where they took her. Because I'm figuring... Her taking me there gets me out of the search perimeter at a minimum, yeah. you know, and, and, and it breaks the scent trail for the dogs, right? So it was, it was at least probably two miles, maybe a mile and a half from from where I walked off. And uh, so she she gets me in the car, and oh, I had my, my prison clothes rolled up under my arm, and I had brand new T-shirt, brand new shorts on that I wore outside the gate that morning. I was running late for the gate, and the worst officer in the world was working the gate. And you can't go with anything but your uniform and your ID to work. Looks like he wants to talk, Bill. We may have to cut this one short. Uh, he'll, 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 he'll try later. So you can't bring anything out. And I was running late because I was in the busy getting rid of some stuff, right, that I didn't want right, you know, right. to find in my locker. And so – I, uh, I, I I had the prison clothes I took out off under the bridge, and then I had them under my arm when I was riding the bike. And I didn't want to just leave them anywhere because, you know, Florida's the blue with the white stripe down the leg and all that. So those are rolled up. And she said, sure, let me just go in for a minute, lock up, and then I'll, you can come with me. And her friend walked off. And I said, can you give me a plastic bag? I'm renovating the condo, and these are really dirty, and I want to put them in something. So she brought me a plastic bag. I put the prison clothes in there. We go to the doctor's office. I, she's waiting in front. I'm like, man, this lady's going to wait for me. So I went back out. I said, oh, they said they took her to, you know, whatever, uh, Port St. Lucie Medical Center, whatever whatever the hospital was. And uh, she says, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I can call for, for a taxi or something and get myself up there. Oh, no, I insist. You're in the car already. Let's go. <laughs> so now this lady's helping me get further from the scene of the escape. You know, we're, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. we're, going, we're going north. This happened at three different places. Everywhere I went, she says, come back out and let me know what's going on. And she's active in her church. And I felt like crap for lying to her. She was a nice, really nice person. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so so we get to uh, the final place. And at that point, I'm just look. I go into the visitors areas and I'm looking for keys because because sometimes people just leave them on the counter. And then if you get the remote control, you can hit it and see which car it goes to and just drive off with somebody else's car. Get out of the area. Yeah. So at this point, I'm starting to see a lot of law enforcement and traffic along US-1. Helicopters, right? Or like at least one, like everywhere, going up and down. What happened was that they did track me right to her front door with, with dogs. Like even, even, even though I was on a bike, somehow they tracked me right to her front door. They started showing my flyer around. Now, I'm in the car with her for like over an hour already. So they had plenty of time to kind of know who took me somewhere and what she's driving. They knew she was driving a white, I think it was a Ford Escape or something. It was <laughs> ironic, right? <laughs> so, the escape they, wheel. Her friend said, oh, my gosh, she just gave him a ride. He's going to check up oh, on his wow. pregnant yeah. wife having giving birth to their twins. And they're like, he doesn't have a wife. They're not having twins. And he just escaped from prison. And the lady nearly had fainted, you know, worried about her friend. And we're just talking about the Bible, and we're talking about, you know, the yeah, if, if, you, if you're a different kind of guy, maybe you would have killed her and taken the car. <laughs> I'm not that kind of guy. I, just, yeah. I felt bad I was lying to her. But um, so 
we get to like the, this final spot. She says, well, there's a lot of cops around. She said, a lot of police driving around at US-1. Maybe we'll just flag one of them down and see if they could call it in and see what, what hospital they took her to. Like, no, thank you. And I says, no, no, no. You see that patio furniture store over there? My uncle works there. He'll let me use his car and phone. And, you know, I didn't want her talking to cops because they're looking for me right now. Yeah. That's why they're in traffic. So we pull in there and I notice there's no cars in front of it yet. And I say, let me off at the Burger King because I'm having blood sugar issues. I need to grab something to eat before I walk back over there. She drops me off at the Burger King. She says, Bill, you said you locked your keys in your wallet in the car. And she takes out a $20 bill. And I, I said, I can't accept your money. I have lied to her. She's offering me money to eat. And she said, oh, you know, come to my church, you know, if you want to reimburse me. But I'm not worried about it. I just can't wait to meet you and your wife. And and I accepted the money, I said. And then she wanted to pray with me, right? And I said, before we pray, can I tell you something? I said, because I can't continue on this line of, you know, conversation. She's, and I just was so guilt-stricken. <clears throat> I get kind of choked up. I said, look, I said, you're really nice. And I'm not like a horrible human being, but I'm not, I'm not, you know, very good sometimes. <laughs> and I said, uh, I need a ride. And this really is an emergency for me, but it has nothing to do with a pregnant wife. And she says, well, what is it? You seem like such a nice guy. What is it? Yeah. I said, it's better. I don't tell you, but you know, please forgive me. And you'll probably find out about it soon enough. And so we prayed, we prayed. She was very nice. We said goodbye. I went in the store. I found out she got back to her place and it was swarming with cops. As she pulls into her condo, they pull her out and lay her, you know, <laughs> where oh, is wow. he? Where is he? Yeah, yeah. So and she she almost had a nervous breakdown over this. I imagine. I imagine. But she said, she said, if that guy's in prison, this our system is broken. That's one thing the detective told me. She said, really? that lady did nothing but speak positively about you and how polite you were and that you tried to tell her the truth and everything. <laughs> And what happened? They, they got you near the near Burger King or something? No, I was out for two weeks at the Burger King. Oh. I uh, I took the oh. clothes. I went to the I I, I went to the restroom. I took the clothes. I, I moved the uh, the trash in one of the cans. I put it to the bottom. I put some handfuls of water on top of it. So nobody wanted to touch it. Put the steak clothes in that can. Washed up a little bit. Caught my breath. And by now, there's a line for me. I actually wanted to get something to eat real quick. But I sure. knew she'd tell him where I was because she was getting home in about, you know, a few more miles, like, you know, maybe seven or eight miles away. I was in Fort Pierce, I believe, and she had to go back to Stewart. So I knew when she got home, she's going to say, hey, I just left him at Burger King, you know. So I knew I had to get out of there quick, and there was a big line. So I looked at all the cameras looking down at the registers, you know, for the for they're looking for the, the stick-up guys. And I looked at one of the cameras, and I went, I went, like, gave him one of those, like, real smart ass, and I left. But when I went to go leave and open the door, I was looking for a car to steal still. Mm. This guy comes walking in. He says, man, you look lost. Are you okay? I said, you see that Mercedes over there? I just locked my keys, and I've been waiting for the locksmith for two hours, and I have an appointment with my realtor, and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, let me go grab something to eat. I'll drive you up there. <laughs> so he got something to eat and then drove me out of the area and then to his place, and right. then we'll tell him. We'll tell this on a part two. The rest of how I got captured, but I stayed out another two weeks. You kept you kept on going, man. Unreal. Just like this guy, he he was gone for weeks also, and, and just yeah. hopping around and everything else. It's uh, some guys are, are locked, but at the end it cost them more, right, Bill? It's not worth it. Not worth he was it in the woods hiding for quite a while, and in my case, there was a point when I ended up in Daytona, and they were looking for me up there. Somebody had spotted me in Daytona, and. <laughs> And you know how they deal with escapees. For my audience, they are allowed to kill you if they know you escape from prison or if you're going over the fence. All the normal rules of engagement no longer apply. Um, in fact, when I was confronted at one point, they had a building surrounded that I was in. I out, I waited them out because I knew there was no exit in circumstances. There was no warrant, and they didn't know where the owner of the place was. But when they were banging on the door, you know, U.S. Marshals, we need to talk to you about your house guest. I just stayed quiet in there like – Crap, I'm going to have to wait them out and pray he doesn't come home and let them in in the meantime. I'm the only one who knew where the guy was. I'm in his place. They did not chase me into the place. So, you know, you don't need a warrant if it's hot pursuit, right? You just go in and grab your guy. Okay. So I was a law clerk and knew they didn't have the exigent circumstances to come in. And I waited them out, waited them out. And, man, they were cops and marshals and all kinds of people staged up outside waiting for me in a helicopter. Yeah, that's going to be part two of me telling the story. We'll um, tell the story of that one. 
Well, that's a good yep. story, Bill. We'll, we'll, we'll look, that's another good one. We'll, we'll throw some more in the last escapee. And, and don't forget also, Bundy was a famous escapee. Well, yeah. ended up committing council horror. He was gone for, for uh, weeks or months, yeah. and he ends up in Tallahassee and, and going to the, the sorority house committing house of horrors and then kills another 12 year old in a middle school. I mean, it happens. I'll tell you what, and you know, for me telling the story, yes, uh, we're doing this for crime prevention. I'm going to tell my audience if you know somebody incarcerated, I was a smart ass. I always looked at it like this I had a cocaine problem. I made a lot of, I committed a lot of crime, you know partially to yeah. support that, partially for greed. But in the end, I always saw myself as a prisoner of the war on drugs, which was declared by President Nixon back in the 70s. And so I was always being the smart ass. What's the, what's the prisoner of war's first obligation? Escape. And my mentality, the whole time I was in prison, no matter when I ever went, figuring ways out. And with my skills with locks and alarms and security and perimeter security yeah. and cameras, yeah. I was always figuring a way out. I was always yeah. thinking of escape. I don't encourage it because I got another 15 years consecutive. Like yeah, you said, people, people can get hurt or killed. I could have been killed. My family, the people I love who, you know, relationships are, are strange. Um, everybody that I know on your visiting list, on your phone list, is harassed by the police, the marshals, trying to track you down. So no, it's, not worth, it's to, not worth it all. It's not worth it, man. Do your time. Deal with the courts. Try to get the hell out. But – you know, I've seen interesting guys stories, where, though. And we'll, we'll, we'll hear some interesting more stories about this and everything else we'll throw together, Bill. We have good shows going on, man. Sounds good. Let, let, me, let me tell you about this one crazy escape real quick one, though. I was in prison. A guy got notified. I think his mother died, got notified at the chaplain's office. The same day his appeals were denied. So he came out of the chaplain's office, hit the fence. It's kind of like death by cop because there's no there's so much razor ribbon. You're not going to get past it. And then there's censors, mm -hmm. right? So they get the alerts. They see he's on the fence. They kill him, and his body's hanging on a razor wire, bleeding oh. out. They locked the rest of the prison down. He got so much bad news on one day with a life sentence, he couldn't hack it anymore, and he was left he, hanging he on be the dead. He, so, he would be dead. Yep. Yeah, so do not do it because somebody's going to get hurt or killed, and your family will be mercilessly, you know, you know, you're law enforcement, so you don't consider it harassment. But people who are innocent don't want to be bothered, like by the police looking for me because they're worried about me. But they also feel like their lives are being interrupted or scrutinized because of the dumb things I was doing. Yeah, it's investigative leads, and people want, and they want to find out what's going on and see if they're, you know, obviously, what do these guys do? A lot of times they reach out to family and friends. Exactly. Yeah. Most escapees are caught at a girlfriend's or the mom's house yeah. within 24 hours. <laughs> All right, Bill. Sounds All right. Good, man. We'll, keep, we'll do some more shows. I think the audience will enjoy this. I don't want people to think my laughter is me enjoying telling the story. There is certain nervous laughter. There's certain like, I can't believe I survived this and here I am today. So there's a little of that. And you keep these things bottled sure. up for so long, you don't talk about them. Now I have a platform to tell people Here's what I did. It was kind of crazy at the moment, but please do not follow in my footsteps. It was not worth it. No, absolutely not. All right, Bill. Okay, Sounds good, we'll man. Wrap, wrap this show. We'll see you guys next time. And this will be out tonight. And please uh, check out Ignacio's books, my books. And thank you for joining us. God bless. All right.